Well, the number of attendees seems to be fairly static now. We haven't increased in the last minute or so. So um, I would suggest we make a start if that's all right. Um, just by way of introduction, so I'm Mike Bartlett, um, been co-chairing the SIG for, uh, I think this is my third year now. So uh, maybe time for a refresh if anybody's interested in, uh, in, uh, in taking it on. Um, the plan for today is um, Graham Miller, who's, who's been um, supporting the SIG for um, quite a while now as well, 18 months or so, um, who's, who's been doing a great job of just uh, providing coordination. Um, he's going to take us through the, the chapter that we've now um, provided to the update of the PRAM guide, the, uh, um, the project risk um, analysis and management guide. Um, and that's that's due for an update any any day now. I think it was due to be concluded at the end of last year. So our chapter is uh, is pretty much finalised now. Um, uh, we did circulate the drafts to the SIG members um, who were involved last year. So um, thank you for all your contributions. So we can run through that for um, for half an hour, and then um, at eleven o'clock. Uh, Mark Mark Turner is going to give us an update as to where he is on on um, some of the supply chain complexities that he's been working on recently, um, and he's done another contribution to the Pram Guide as well. So um, that's an interesting sort of connection. So it's it, it's good that we're having an influence. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's great that we've managed to get two uh, contributions to the Pram Guide. Um, and in the last half hour, I thought it'd be worth just having as a general chat. So that would be half 11. We'll have a general chat around um, what other uh, issues people have, what other direction they think the SIG could take, um, and potentially what other publications we could work on to, to get you know, a, a more wider understanding of complexity and um, what we can do about it. So um, uh, it'd be great to get your thoughts about that um, a bit later on. So if that's okay, welcome all. Welcome to the, the Risk and Complexity SIG. Um, shall we hand over to Graham? Just take us through the, uh, uh, the chat that we've written. Is that okay, Graham? Yeah, sounds good. Um, okay, so yeah, as Mike said, um, thanks everybody who got involved and contributed to this chapter. We've uh, had some really good collaboration on it and I think we've produced a pretty strong chapter. Um, so thanks for that. Um, so I'll just run through it kind of section by section. So we start off with a couple of quotes here. We've got uh, Stephen Hawking talking about the 21st century being the century of complexity, where we might actually manage to start getting a handle on the complex uh, systems that operate in all kinds of different areas. Um, and obviously our interest is, uh, is major projects. Um, and then we get a, a quote here from Mark Wilde, who is the chief executive at Crossrail, uh, talking about complexity on Crossrail and how it was not fully understood. Um, so that's highlighting the need to, to for the, the industry to focus on it and see how we can develop the, the practice. Um, so we start off then uh, talking about what complexity actually is, how do we define it? So there are various uh, elements which which identify complexity. Uh, so we talk about multiple parts over a, a set amount of time, um, a set number of components, and unique environments. So down here we talk about uh, we, we give a definition. Um, so a complex project is a volume and uniqueness of components and environment which are novel, um, and maybe above the, the capability or capacity of the, t the team to determine cause and effect. Um, so we look at this in a little bit more depth. We talk about the, the spectrum of complexity from uh, predictable, simple, and all the way up to chaotic and unknown and unpredictable. So simple as you might expect, then having a few state, having few stakeholders, very little ambiguity, and existing within a, a well understood environment. So delivering projects that have been delivered time and again in the past successfully. Um, and then increasing in complexity and, and complication as you as you progress through the the scale. Um, so a greater number of uh, stakeholders, a degree of ambiguity in, in the environment. 
uh, up to complexity, um, so involving highly interconnected relationships between stakeholders and highly ambiguous environments. Um, and then we get to co co uh, chaotic projects, which are seemingly beyond the control and cannot be easily predicted. Um, and this is due to minute changes, um, which can lead to compounded variations of outputs. So, yeah, in order to support the, the, the description there of chaotic projects, we uh, the quote Lorenz in 1963, uh, and the, the famous analogy of the butterfly wings flapping the butterfly effect, um, which is which is really pertinent. It's a, it's a really powerful kind of image to demonstrate that, that the slightest of uh, changes in variables can have a, a big impact on the outputs. So we then focus in on why it's important to risk management. So crucial characteristics of complexity, causes are difficult for us to trace, determining the immediate and subsequent impacts are difficult. And uh, there's additional systemic risk, which is introduced in complex projects. So, yeah, if we don't um, if we don't recognise the, the the additional um, controls, then it can quickly descend into chaos. So, we talk here about feedback loops and uh, unforeseen emergent behaviour being present in complex projects and complex systems. Um, and then here we're talking about the chaotic nature of, of some projects. Um, so again, given given examples and, and definitions there as to how you can identify it. So we talk here about the, the process for dealing with complexity on projects. Then, so we talk about how, first of all, how do you identify a complex project? Um, so. We use typical uh, identification processes like the vessel, for example. Um, so we we'd recognise that these are still useful, but we need additional focus when we're dealing with complexity. So um, we we talk here about the, the components within a complex system being unlikely to exist in isolation. So we really need to recognise that. The interconnectedness and the interdependency of risk, um, and look at ways to map that and make sure that we're getting uh, we're getting a full picture of what our actual exposure is, so that we can start to drill down and manage it. So one of the key things about a complex project then is the volume um, being considered. So mega projects uh, talk about huge volumes of uh, different variables that we need to get a handle on. So we look here at the long del uh, delivery schedules, um, multi-tiered supply chains, uh, large numbers of stakeholders. So we really need to get a handle on all the different components that are contributing to making a project complex as opposed to just complicated. So we give some quite straightforward sample questions that you can use in, in doing this. Um, so the first one being, how, do, how does this project uh, cost schedule number of stakeholders to compare to the average? Um, how many suppliers are involved? So what other projects with similar volumes have been delivered elsewhere so as we can draw lessons from them? And what are the top drivers for the volumes? Uh, we then talk about the uniqueness element of complexity. So um, how unique is the project that you're delivering? Has it been delivered elsewhere? Um, or are, are, are you delivering a completely uh, novel project? So the vast majority of components have known and predictable characteristics. However, complex projects are likely to require highly unusual component, components. Um, so we need to identify these. Uh, and again, we give some straightforward, easy to, uh, to use questions um, to help you do that. So what physical components are unusual? Are any components, particularly software solutions uh, or technological advancements, been used? Um, is the end solution a first of a kind in the world? Um, in which case, it's, it's likely to be far more complex. Um, 
And are there any unusual engineering or architectural details that need to be considered? <clears throat> so that's the project you're delivering in itself, but then the environment in which it's been delivered is, is a key element in the complexity. So um, so yeah, we need to do an assessment, of the, carry out an assessment of the environment to see what unique elements are specific to that and can then impact on the complexity of your project. So considering geographical, social, polit uh, political, uh, economic characteristics. Um, and again, some straightforward questions. Uh, have projects like this been delivered with comparable and comparable uh, environments? Are there any characteristics which could make this project particularly susceptible to public or political disruption? Um, what, how is the economic climate for the project and are investors stable? And is the team in the same geographical location? So that's particularly pertinent, I think, now given that uh, people have been working from home for quite some time and uh, different uh, different uh, resources spread across the, the globe on a major project. Uh, and then we talk about novelty, so how unique is the project that we're delivering? Um, so we talk here about individuals uh, being chosen based on their previous experiences. Um, and uh, yeah, we look at um, the typical potential for biases in there, the founding projects, um, and how that can be compounded and, and increase the complexity generally. <clears throat> so we quote here uh, Daniel Kahneman, um, who's written extensively on uh, heuristics and biases and what have you. It's really interesting stuff. So taking these things into consideration because they all contribute. Um, so again, a few questions there to, to frame the, the problem. Uh, have all key parties uh, delivered comparable projects? Um, what are the significant individual expertise that have been relied upon? Um, and are we using specialist resources, which which are going to be uh, kind of hard to find if we need to replace them? Um, and are there any particular uh, concerns for transparency of information? So we kind of touched on it here. We go into a bit more detail on the, the team capacity and capability. Um, so we've only got a, a finite uh, ability to handle the issue arising from the issues arising from projects. So unforeseen co complexity, dimension, uh, compounding information overlaid by uh, overload teams and frequently result in crisis management. So what we're saying here is that. Um, if a, if a project's complexity is beyond the capabilities and the, the capacity of the team, you can quickly slip into a reactionary kind of crisis management modes where you're firefighting, and as a result of that, you're not making the best uh, decisions. Potentially, there's there's scope for mistakes to be made, uh, rather than using foresight and uh, kind of proactive mitigations to to manage your exposure. Um, so that's certainly that's a big one to be aware of. Um, so we talk about the complexity levels, with low, medium, high, and extreme. Some of the, the elements that make those up. So we're trying to make it straightforward for for project and program risk uh, practitioners to identify complexity and uh, and ring fence it, get a, get a, um, get some parameters around it so as to manage it effectively. Uh, so again, we give some sample questions. Is the team fully resourced? Uh, who are the key subject matter experts? Is the staff turnover or churn uh, high for the project? Uh, are there adequate knowledge capture and the succession planning procedures in space in place? So that's a big one. How are you managing your your knowledge? Um, if somebody retires or or moves to another organisation, how are you capturing their their knowledge on the project and feeding that back into lessons learned? Um, and what what are the management bottlenecks that could exist? So, um, say for example, you've got you've well, you've got individual uh, sole sign off, so that could create delays um, if if you're relying solely on one person to to sign off key milestones or um, other other components of the project. Um, and then we talk about stakeholders. So. 
a lot of this is, is quite standard practice already, but we're talking about how you can use existing tools to apply it to complexity and then kind of beef them up to make sure that you're you're really understanding what you're dealing with. Um, so we talk about there being a range of stakeholders on a, on every project, internal and external. Um, variation in demands been placed on the, the project depending on the type of stakeholder and what their what their requirements and needs are. Um, so we talk here as well. We touch on the Black Swan events and how they are uh, they have to be recognised and um, actively managed as part of a complex project, especially if it's on a, a multi-year uh, schedule. Uh, and then we t we talk about the techniques which can be used. Um, so looking into the external enterprise, the extended enterprise. So not just within the project itself, but Again, considering the, the environment in which it's operating. Um, so you'll probably recognise this, the, the complexity in stakeholders uh, that, that keep satisfied, manage closely, monitor and keep informed matrix. Um, so again, in relation to the uh, stakeholders, we've, we've given some prompt questions which can help you get started as to how to look at complexity in relation to stakeholders. So of the stakeholders identified, um, which have the most requirements, uh, which are most susceptible to changing environments, which are most financially or commercially involved, um, which uh, stakeholders are in competition with the project or its objectives, and uh, have any displayed adversarial contractual behaviours in the past. Um, so we go on to the assessment and analysis. Once you've once you've understood your your complexity and the, the related risks, uh, we need to think about how to analyse them and assess them. So um, again, we're talking here about the, the sheer volume. So delivering a, a multi-billion pound project is a different animal to delivering. A one a, a million, um, so we need to consider the the volume of the the components making up the complexity, um, and again we touch here on the the feedback loops and the un unforeseen emergent behaviour that's inherent in a complex system. Sorry, schoolboy error. I forgot to plug my laptop in. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, the, the, the number of interactions, the sheer volume of interactions and the, the relationships between risk entities uh, growing exponentially and, and uh, the activities of the nodes within that, that uh, structure. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're, what we're calling for here really is far more detailed and intelligent <coughs> use of technology to model our risk exposure um, and give us a, a more realistic uh, forecast as to what we're being exposed to. Um, so we've talked about the exponential growth. We've, uh, yeah, we've said here that we uh, we recognise that the project management tool set is, is suboptimal uh, potentially to manage truly complex projects. So we need to look at ways to enhance these. Um, so, for example, logic entered into schedule tools will often be min the minimum uh, necessary to generate critical path analysis. Uh, risks are generally considered as discrete events. Um, if both eyes are, are used to illustrate common causes and consequences, it's hard uh, to model these interactions in typical tools available. Um, so, yeah, there's a there's a need to to explore different model techniques and see how we can we can include more in our um, and we talk about correlation so as a very minimum we need to be considering correlation when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at complex projects uh, the interactions between the the risks and how they influence other uh, other elements in the project so understanding where our sources of risks are um, so the existence of risks. Um, so if a risk occurs, this is this is a definition of the types of correlation. So the existence of risk. Uh, one risk increases or decreases the likelihoods 
um, making it more or less likely to occur. Then the, the impact of risks, um, make it, if, if one risk happens, it's, it's um, related to another impact. So just kind of cherry picking here. So <clears throat> yeah, talking about, they were promoting here the, the use of more sophisticated techniques. So including artificial intelligence and machine learning in our uh, risk analysis. Um, so we talked down here about what those might actually be. So the, the, the complexity SIG uh, has highlighted some of these. Uh, Cause association and stochastic modeling, business informatics, so risk and decision analytics, network lens tool sets, and complexity schedule analysis. So we're we're basically saying then that we've we've we we need to identify where we're dealing with a complex project and identify the, the elements that are making that project complex so as we can start to identify all associated risks and model them effectively. So in terms of a response then, um, we need network-based solutions. We need to address behaviours and cultures, so the human factors which are, which are inherent in a complex system and, and in the assessment of the related risks. Um, and giving specific consideration to the following, so um, risks identified which contribute to complexity should be emphasised in reporting. Uh, collaborative management responses, uh, required to, to proactively manage these risks. Identification of early warning signs so as we can nip uh, potential complexity risks in the bud. Um, so yeah, with a, with a view to avoiding the, the project descending into the, the crisis reactionary mode that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we highlight then, as a consequence of that, we may, we may want to explore crisis management uh, methodologies in order to manage complexity risk uh, to enhance the, the other methods identified above. Um, and then conducting crisis management tests uh, to, to stop things from spiraling out of control. Um, and that's that's us. So we've, we've referenced here the various books we used and we've created some new terms. Um, so defined complexity uh, exhi exhibiting dynamic interactions between the parts and the behaviour produced as those results, uh, as a result of those interactions, cannot be explained as the simple sum of the parts. Um, then we talk about a, a complex project, so one that has a volume and uniqueness of components and environment uh, which are novel and or above the, cap the capacity or capability of the team to determine its cause and effects, and then complexity risk. Uh, the risk associated with complex projects and or stemming from complexity. Brilliant. So Thanks, Greg. That's, oh, our, that's our final draft as submitted. Excellent. So a um, couple of, of, of comments. Um, one is this is something that we can all use now, hopefully. Um, you know, the, the checklists are, are in here. We, they could be turned into a little tool for people. Um, you know, it's not hard for anyone to do, so I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't see it as being um, something that we would need to produce. Um, but clearly, you know, it'd be great for for the for the SIG members to um, start making people aware that this exists. Um, uh, if you haven't got a copy already, we can obviously make a copy available, or they should be able to download it from the uh, um, the website now. Um, the second thing which which we should draw out is obviously we've referenced our SIG maintaining some tools and techniques so um, we just need to follow through on that and make sure you know that uh, if people have got um, ideas obviously the ones that are in this paper we can uh, we can make sure are available through through the, the SIG site but um, uh, if anybody's got other thoughts other suggestions for tools and techniques let's let's start to to create a little library of them so that um, if people and hopefully they will get drawn to our drawn to our SIG area through this guide, um, they can actually see that content starting to uh, um, to add value and develop over time. So uh, that'd be great if people could could contribute. And obviously, if you've got um, alternatives, we can put these up as well. We can we can um, illustrate where they may be advantageous um, and experiences as well. So 
I think this group is probably more familiar, more aware, more, more um, concerned about complexity than perhaps um, many people in the project world who uh, um, you know, are perhaps not as, as, as um, cognizant of the, the, the separation of complexity from general, general risk management. So um, let's, let's make sure we, we, we maintain our, our, um, our sort of front end awareness and ability to keep providing guidance. Um, anybody got any observations or comments? Unusual for this group to be silent. <laughs> no. So, Hi, yeah, Mike, I'll start here just to um, just to test the communications because um, I don't know if everyone can speak. That might might be one of the problems. Oh, they should be able to. I thought um, thought we'd open it up for to speak, but. Definitely the chat is open. Okay, well, um, I won't perpetuate the silence. Um, please, you know, give us feedback um, uh, through, the, through the website, please. And um, yeah, start to, start to use this. Um, uh, I think there's lots of space that we can, we can uh, really exploit, really sort of, um, provide guidance in in terms of you know just making making people aware that standard risk management practices probably don't address complexity particularly well so um, um, I think we've got a really good uh, contribution here we've got um, you know we, we said we would get something published and we have um, we could potentially do some more publicity we could uh, put some articles into um, other journals if people are interested I think the um, uh, definitely scope to put something into um, inform and enterprise risk um, so yeah so watch this space and uh, yeah we welcome your contributions all right so our next speaker is uh, Mark Turner um, and he's going to um, give us an update on on where his thinking is on on supply chain risk hopefully mark you've you've uh, You've worked out how to present, have you? No, I have not. Um, oh. <laughs> Rory's not got back to me yet. There's no no communication coming from him there. So um, you can see my see your face. You can see my yep. face, but I don't know how to use. Let's see if I can make this work then. Now that so, now that I'm on. Hi, Mark. I think if you if you select the change presenter icon with the two computer screens. Uh, there should be oh, a I've, got, I've, got the, I've got the capacity to do that. Uh, there you go. Okay, so I, perfect. Think... I, can now, I can now see the show screen. So stuff. Uh, Brilliant. Uh, the question is, which screen am I showing? <laughs> well, we can still see. Uh, I can see the um, the presentation, Mark, and I you can see, see the your presentation. Page. Can you? That's fantastic. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, if you have me to take over, then. If, if you're fine with that, yeah, that'd be great. Super. All right. Well, um, thank you for very much for inviting me to um, to give an overview of my views here on um, complexity and what I've been doing with some supply chain uh, uh, analyses in terms of complexity. Uh, just a little bit of background about me. So um, I'm a fellow of the Institute. Um, I run my own uh, consulting company. Um, I've also been recently elected as a director of the IRM. I've got 25 years of background in risk management and project management uh, specifically. Um, and before my career in the risk management space, um, I was a Royal Naval Submariner. Now, the reason I mention that today is because we're in the process of forming a new SIG. So if anybody out there has uh, affiliations or um, history with the armed forces, we're going to be having this new armed forces community SIG. Um, hopefully, in the next month or so, we're going to get that formed. So, um, please feel free to contact me about becoming a member of that new SIG. Good. All right. Um, so, before I 
actually launch into what I've got to say, what I'd really want to do is thank the people who have influenced my thinking. And I think, you know, it, it's really worth bearing in mind that these ideas don't come from isolation. They come from networking and reading and being very much connected into the zeitgeist of what's happening with uh, this type of thinking. And I call it the giant's breadcrumbs because really what I've done is I've, I've been picking up the breadcrumbs of some people who are really sort of powerful thought leaders in all of these types of areas. And I've highlighted three books here which have been very influential in my thinking. Um, the Knefflin Framework, which you'll probably recognize from the, um, um, the model that was in the previous presentation there, and I'll expand on that in a minute, going from a simple to um, complicated through to complex and chaotic, uh, very much influenced by the Knefflin uh, frameworks. Concepts about risk and resilience and building an immune system has come through from this new book by um, General Stanley McChrystal, which um, I've found very interesting and has helped me shape some of the concepts I've got around narrative and the way that we present our expectations of uh, outcomes. So I'd really highly recommend that. Um, the book by Yuval Harari, Sapiens, also very, very influential on my thinking about how narratives drive the perceptions of success. Um, and I'd also just like to thank Russell for uh, um, allowing me to share some of the um, outputs of my analyses because it was based on some work that I did with them that uh, I, I've been able to create this, this um, uh, graphical representations of complex supply chains. Um, so the first thing I really want to do, which is quite controversial, is say that projects do not really exist. There's nothing in the world that you could point to and say that is a project. Okay, projects are essentially the ideas that people um, identify with and ag um, um, accumulate around in order to achieve a specific objective but there's no such thing as a project it's just an objective which everybody then buys into the story of we are doing a project okay um, and that's those ideas came from Harari the, the idea that things don't really exist money doesn't exist countries don't exist projects don't exist it's just the story that we tell ourselves our internal narrative and the dialogue which we share amongst ourselves as human beings so what does a project manager do if they're existing in a place where projects don't really exist? And it's my belief that what they are is the storyteller. And as the storyteller, they're significantly influential as to how that story is understood and represented by other human beings in, in, their, um, uh, commun in the communication. And so it's, it's really important that when project managers are talking about complicated projects or complex projects, they actually recognize that the words that they use are influential. And, and I love this phrase here, um, reality is mediated by the language we use to describe it. The metaphors we use shape the world and our interactions to it. And it's really pertinent when thinking about how do you influence the outcomes of complex and complicated thinking. So if we do think we live in a complex project, yeah, it's really worthwhile challenging ourselves and saying, okay, how how complete is the story which we're trying to tell people? Yeah. Are we looking at it from a very singular view or are we looking at it from a very high um, uh, perspective? such that we're actually encompassing all of the attributes that make it a complex. When we talk about how we see that project yeah, in its terms, we also need to then challenge the approaches that we take to managing that project. Um, and, I'll, and I'll go on to that in just a, in, a, in a couple of slides of time. But when we're looking at the approaches that we've traditionally trained to do as risk managers and as project managers, yeah, they follow very rigid and linear approaches. And we need to challenge whether or not the language which we're using encourages the appro appropriate approaches to managing the, the project and the risks associated with those projects. So the bottom line there is choose your language very wisely when we're talking about 
complexity and complex projects. Um, and really, the, the paper which we've submitted for the Pram Guide really breaks this down. And you know, I really advocate that people use the correct terminology when discussing um, issues of complexity on projects. So a simple project. I see it very much deterministic. You turn the handle on a cog and you will always get the exact response in, in, the, um, in, the, in the system. So turning the handle on one cog will result in the other cog turning 50 times. Okay, it's a, it's a, will always happen today, will always happen tomorrow. There is no ambiguity in that system. However, you move along that continuum to complicated projects and complicated projects start introducing some ambiguity. There are nuances associated with the stakeholders, the environment, which means that it's no longer purely deterministic and that there's some probabilistic causes to the output. But it's still mostly predictable. It's like um, having an engine in your car. Engines in your car are highly complicated. However, I can build exactly the same engine a million times and it will perform in exactly the same way. So it's, it's highly predictable, but there may be things that can go wrong. So if I have a, a, a tolerance issue on one of my manufactured parts, then that could introduce instability within that um, complicated machine to cause it to break down. However, it is highly predictable what the outcome of that machine is a million times over. However, if we move into the next stage, which is complex. Complex is about the interrelationships between things. And there is significant ambiguity in that environment such that you will never be able to replicate that environment ever again. It's like saying, um, if I've got a football team on the pitch, yeah, never in a million years will all the same players be in exactly the same position yeah, ever again. They're gonna be minor, minor fluctuations in that, um, in the, in that uh, system. And as a consequence, every game of football is, ever, is gonna be unique. There will never be two games of football which will ever be uh, re replicated in exactly the same way. Because of the emergent behavior and the emergent properties of humans interacting with a ball in a pitch. So there's relationships, there's ambiguity, and it becomes so much harder to predict the outcome of what that network is. In exactly the same way, it's impossible to predict the outcome of a football match. And then for completeness, we look at chaotic. And chaotics are relationships which are in flux with each other, yeah, highly unpredictable, and it is impossible to, to determine what the outcomes will be. Okay, so come, come back to what I was saying about language. Choose your language very carefully. Don't convolute the words complicated and complex when talking about projects. So this leads on to the idea of framing your story. And when you're looking at a complex system, and this is a genuine um, piece of work which I did looking at the interrelationship between certain organizations that are on a FTSE 100. And you can see, if I zoomed in on one or two of these uh, relationships, which might have a one-to-one -one simple uh, um, relationship, then you might be fooled into thinking that you're looking at a complicated system. However, as you zoom out, yeah, you'll find quite quickly that what you thought initially was complicated suddenly becomes complex by virtue of the number of relationships and the ambiguity uh, around it. And exactly the same as in projects. If I looked at a project and I zoomed in to the relationship between, say, for example, a manufacturer uh, and a supplier, then that simple one-to-one -one relationship could be deemed as being uh, either simple or complicated uh, by virtue of the, the things not necessarily happening in the infrastructure of the uh, relationship between them. However, if I zoom out and I can start seeing that the supply, the supplier has multiple facets, it's got multiple people, it's got infrastructure problems of its own, it becomes very much more along the lines of complexity. 
So drawing that boundary around your project is highly important. And the, the phraseology which I've started to introduce into some of my thinking follows along the pattern of what we call KDEX. So this is, stands for the changes, the assumptions, dependencies, exclusions and constraints. And I've highlighted here that excluding your narrative is probably more important than what is included by cutting out the significantly more complex aspects of maybe human relationships or supply chain um, interconnectivity can draw the picture either from a complicated or a complex and, and vice versa. So setting the frame around your project by excluding the appropriate aspects is highly important. So that comes on to then my continuum of predictability, which is replicated in the, pro, um, in the document which we've submitted. Um, and the bit that I really want to stress is you go from being able to predict things to being able to completely unpredict things. And that is a continuum. And somewhere along that line is where you're drawing your, your boundary of the project. Okay. And one side of the boundary, your traditional linear approaches to making things work have got a good chance of succeeding. On the other side of the boundary, linear approaches will fail. Okay. So what I mean by that is we're all familiar with the plan, do, check, act approach. It says you're going to do something to a system and you can predict the outcome of what that system might be. However, a non a non linear approach can be summed up as saying, for example, the sense, probe, reflect and respond methodology, which uh, a lot of the Kinefin frameworks employ in the complex side of uh, uh, of of the uh, continuum, and so it's this non-linear approaches which I've been trying to apply to the work that I've been doing in my analysis of complex supply chains. Uh, interesting enough, I was speaking to a health and safety uh, risk manager this morning, and this sort of concept, she says, this actually has real applicability in the complexity of humans yeah not just in projects but when i'm trying to do with health and safety it's really interesting to think that why do my actions which are essentially linear not work in a health and safety environment and that's because the interactivity between individual humans is not complicated it's complex uh, and so i think for her the idea that we can't apply linear in a health and safety environment is a bit of a uh, uh, a move in her thought processes and she's going to try and understand better how we can use non-linear approaches in the health and safety environment which i thought was a really fascinating conversation one of the big issues about um, complex situations is time yeah and we mustn't forget this dimension of time as i mentioned earlier the idea of a car i build a car engine it works today it will work the same in 10 years time yeah not not necessarily um, considering degradation of uh, parts but they're predictable as well because there's an entire science behind the um, um, the degradation of, of components however in a complex system time is a real significant factor because complex systems will change rapidly as we change through time and the emergent properties of complex systems are very much time dependent. So, so when considering complexity, be very, very conscious of when it is that you're analyzing your system because what you, results you get today will not be the same results that you get tomorrow. So take, take very much notice of that. Okay, so um, looking at a supply chain complexity so this is an analysis that i did of an organization and they asked me to 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 look at the first tier of their supply chain and what i was able to do was determine for each one of the first tier who they were also connected to that were also first tier relationships and as you can see 
I, I call these the fish diagrams because they always tend to look a little bit like fish. And if you look at the tail of the fish on the right hand side, you can see these are very much simple linear relationships that the organization has with individual or, uh, companies. There is no inter interactivity between the individual companies. However, if you look at the main body of the fish, the left hand side, you can see that each one of the blue squares represents a individual company and they're either connected by supply or customer relationships and this web of interconnectivity is clearly a complex system such that if we were the um, to make a change to the relationship that we have with one of our suppliers then that relationship may well have a knock-on effect to other part of my immediate supply chain so if i terminated a contract with one supplier and that made them no longer uh, um, solvent then it might not be just that one supplier that in, interact well that feeds back to us because their insolvency could impact on two three four other suppliers within our chain and that would then feed back to us and we would see that by making one significant change we are affecting, effectively impacted by several failures and it almost becomes a cascade failure across my network because of a decision that I made in complexity but thinking about it in terms of linearity. Another mean, so okay, so if, you, if we look at the um, approaches to a non-linear um, methodology of the sense, probe, reflect and react then the first step in that is to sense and by sense what I what I tend to think of is I've walked into a dark warehouse and I've now got a flashlight and I'm going to shine it around and I want to find out what is in my environment and what the relationships that I have to the environment is. Um, the diagram here is another one of my analyses where I was trying to compare myself, uh, the company I was working for, and a competitor to understand the relationships that we had between us because okay it's quite simple to say in a linear fashion company A is a competitor with com company B however a deeper look at their supply chains can see that there's interactivity between the, um, the competition which is very much deeper than a simple linear relationship now that's this brings up some real fascinating possibilities such as if I make changes to my supply chain, what impact could that have on my competitor? Will it make them stronger? Will it make them weaker? If I form relationships with, for example, in this particular chart, if I formed relationships with the supply chain members, which my competitor has only the relationships with, then maybe I can destabilize their network uh, and, be, and derive some competitive advantage. So clearly, having this sense of the network and the complexity between supply chains can be extremely valuable and having a clear understanding of how your influence on that network can drive competitive advantage for your organization um, and when we talk about influence on network we talk about things such as the customers the suppliers the partners the investors um, and you shouldn't forget how some of these relationships work. So, for example, yeah, if I've got multiple projects, then on one project who I might be partnering with, they might be a competitor on another one of my projects within my same organization. Similarly, the bank who I deal with, and that's, a, that's another relationship, might be an investor in our organization or an investor in our competition's organization. So understanding the relationships that you have across the entire environment in which you operate and not just the supply chain can be very significant and competitive um, provide competitive advantage so we then move on to the next step of the non-linear approach and that is to probe and examine and understand the types of effects that your influence on your network can have and there are several me methods uh, we mentioned some of them in the paper um, two which i'm um, aware of and I have some familiarity with is agent-based modeling which enables you to use 
sophisticated computer modeling to determine the effects that changes in your network may have. Okay. Um, and then the second one, which I'm a bit more familiar with, which is the graph analytics, and that is to understand how the models that we created are interrelated and how changes within single nodes or even um, groups of nodes within that network has a ripple effect, a um, cascading effect across the network and the subsequent emerging properties of the network. Okay, we then step back with that analysis in mind and reflect on what is it telling us here? Yeah? Do we see what we expect to see from that analysis? Bearing in mind the point that I made earlier about time, because the, the analysis I do today, based on the knowledge I have, will be different from the effects it might have tomorrow because of changes in, in the system. But in general, we can talk about the relationships and the emergence of um, expected properties of the changes which we're going to introduce. Now, it's really important that the minor variations of the starting conditions have some significant impacts on the end result. And we reflected on this in the paper again, um, the butterfly effect. It says, it's impossible to understand how minor variations across a significant environment can end up resulting in, well, from a butterfly flapping its wings in the jungle to a tornado sweeping on a different continent. And this comes back to the first point I made, which starts talking about the language which we use. Yeah? So we, we need to be talking in terms of non, not deterministic outcomes, but in thoughts of the grander picture. How are we preparing our stakeholders to accept the news that we don't know exactly what could happen yeah uh, and, and preparing their expectations is a significant element of managing the overall project and the narrative of that project so finally armed with what we know yeah we can then start making some decisions to see how our influence on the network gets us the expected results and knowing full well that the story will never end in the way that we predict it, because it is impossible to predict a complex systems. So, so we have to be very cognizant that the outcomes are only going to be um, uh, as effective as the data that we have managed to collect in the sensing environment. And even then, we know that the there's going to be nuances in the specifics, the spe specifics of the data that we start from. And I love this, I love this phrase that George Box is famously quoted as saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think that's really the, the bottom line of anything that you do with regards to analyses in these environments. Yeah, they will be wrong. There's no doubt about it. I'm 100% certain that I will never be able to model the real world outcomes of a project based on a model. So what's the secret? And the secret is the communication skills and the soft skills which we as project managers and risk managers bring to bear to that project because it's such an ambiguous situation that we will never be correct. And if you set yourself up to saying, I know what's going to happen, then you're setting yourself up for a fall. And so you need to take charge of the narrative and be sure that you're using the right terms, that you're using appropriate language to set the expectations that people know that you will never know the outcome. And you can only ever talk in probabilities and estimations, but never with any determined sort of outcome and, and you know without any conviction of what the results will be. So in conclusion, remember at the end of the day, the language that you use to present the results of any actions or any analyses or the outcome will have a significant impact on the perception of the story that you're having because projects don't exist. 
So it's completely uh, up to you how you control that narrative and how you use the vocabulary around the simple, the complicated and the complex. And ensure that when you're talking about the difference between complicated and complex, that you start using the appropriate tools to get the desired effects. Namely, you use linear tools to work in complicated environments and you use, use non-linear tools to work in complex environments. And as I said, never forget that projects do not exist. It's only the story that exists. And it's this story which is the most powerfully influenced by us as the project professionals and the way that we tell it and the language that we use when we tell it. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'm more than happy to take any questions. If anybody wants to um, find out more, they can contact me via my website or feel free to um, message me on LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to connect on LinkedIn. I love building these social networks because they're chaotic and chaos is actually a really fun way of building your knowledge because something that I know is something that somebody else doesn't know and vice versa and that's that sharing of that knowledge and the emergent properties of those complex social interactions which actually drives humanity forward. So thank you. That's brilliant Mark, no, thank you very much for that. I, I, it sort of makes me feel a bit upset that all the projects that I've worked on over the last few years don't exist but uh, I, I, think I, know, I think I know where you're coming from. Um, yeah I think the that that comment about talking in ranges, talking about you know talking in uncertainties, is really hard. Um, the higher up you get in government, particularly, um, and maybe it's a human trait. You know, if you would sort of uh, ask ask a builder how much your um, your extension was going to be, and he said, "Oh, it could be it could be between you know it could be between ten thousand and fifty thousand, you'd probably try and pin them down a bit more. So there's, there's a bit of a human trait, and that's certainly evident within government um their desire to have fixity you know it's definitely going to be complete by this date it's definitely going to only cost this amount of money is a real hurdle and you know we've seen success within the department for transport is now quoting ranges for things like hs2 which is brilliant but other government departments are still very fixed on you know just having something specific they can they can relate to so um it's a challenge for all of us, I think, in the project space to um, to try and make people cognizant that certainty is, is really hard to get. Absolutely. So, I think I've just found um, a button to unmute everybody. So, um, uh, apologies if it's actually been uh, um, something that you haven't been able to do. Um, I, I, uh so i think everybody is capable of speaking now if you um if you want to try and unmute yourself if you've got any observations or comments would somebody like to test it Hi Mike, it's uh, Ennis MacArthur. I think uh, it's working from my end. Oh, brilliant! Hi Ennis, thanks for thanks for uh, coming back to us. <laughs> no worries. I don't have a specific question right now, but just testing it for you. Oh, brilliant! No, thank you. It's always nice to find somebody at the other end of the call, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, any comments on on Mark's presentations? Any questions? Or anything on the um, the pram guide? Um, is it something we can all use? Yeah, I'd, I'd, just, <laughs> I'd just like to say it's, it was a fascinating presentation, Mark. Really, is really enjoyable. Um, a, a real eye opener, actually. I hadn't thought about the competitive advantage afforded by managing your supply chain effectively and, and looking at the risk and the relationships so that's it's really interesting stuff something i'm going to go and look into more i think yeah it, it's something which it was an emergent property of the work that i was doing because it was fascinating to first look at how our relationships between supply chains are connected 
but then you throw in that question of competitive yeah, and the competition and you suddenly realize that careful analysis can really highlight yeah, opportunities for you to either beat your competition or if you're a bit more nefarious to take down your competition by disruption of the supply chain mm -hmm. <clears throat> i remember there was a story a, a, a case that i heard about i think it was as part of a uh, master's in risk um there was a component a supply chain component supplied to jeep and it was a critical component but it was really tiny and uh, it was produced by a little independent organization and they were being squeezed so much by the the, the competition and that the the demand was so high but the the unit price was so low um that they were struggling to to remain uh to remain in business and uh, they only jeep only just found out about the criticality of this component in the last minute just before they, they went bust and managed to reach a, an agreement to increase the price the unit price and but had they gone out of business, then the, the, the whole production line would have gone to halt, which obviously massive ramifications. So it's, uh, well, it's, it's yeah. fascinating. It's for want of a nail, the battle was lost. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yes, and it's interesting how that, that analogy is actually um, very useful from a complexity point of view, because it's that it's that sort of interconnection, which people just don't think of. Oh, it's, it's, it's only a small component that isn't right. Well, actually, that has a knock-on effect to the bigger system, and that has a knock-on effect to the, the bigger system. So suddenly, you're into um, you know serious serious compound effects from you know it was a butterfly analogy, isn't it? It's um, you know the, the the greatest disasters stem from the tiniest little um, initiation. Hi, Mike. Just uh, in this again. Um, just uh, yeah, following on from that. Not so much a question, but just more observations from experience. I think is yeah, I, I agree with that. And ultimately, I think one of the areas that has been most subject to human behaviour and optimism bias is is downplaying complexity. Um, yeah. You know, when you're sitting there in a the room and uh, with your project directors and, and so on and so forth. They're all, my experience has always been, they're always very keen to play it down. So it feels like there's a little something in the space of educating these people a little bit more about it, I think. Um, it, it's great, the presentations are great. It's great seeing this in the risk forum. I think there's just that little push beyond the risk forum as well as where, where it will be a good kind of area to get into. Absolutely, and it's not. What, what's happening there is the directors themselves are controlling the narrative yeah, and they're, they're reframing the degree at which you're viewing the, um, the the picture and they're trying to bring it down to the point where it becomes simple and easy to, for humans to understand rather than drawing back and zooming out and seeing how actual complexity really is, is driving that picture because people shy away from complexity. It, it's a natural tendency to want the world to be deterministic if i do action a i'm going to get result b but the world isn't like that and it's just a question of how do you control the narrative to make the world appear controllable when even even the ability to control the world is a fallacy <laughs> and, and it's a very interesting because i think the other big issue we have on projects is our systems are all linear they're all you know the schedules are done from a, a linear um progression perspective you know it's all critical path from a to b to c there's no recognition of intrinsic complexity within schedule and schedules um our project controls world works on linear forecasting so earn value metrics take previous um uh, progress and just merely linearly extrapolate it there's never anything that illustrates that actually it could be a power law type problem I've, the, you know, funny i've just finished reading hubbard's book the failure of risk management um well, although he seems to have got a massive chip on his shoulder about um about project um risk management in particular you know there are some interesting nuggets in there that illustrate some of the failings of of you know, standard risk analyses and how you know it can't model complexity properly even when you do sort of heavy correlation it still generates symmetrical models which clearly don't relate to history so i think i think i think it's some really 
interesting stuff that's going to come out. And, and I think we can be we can be influential in this space by starting to move away from the historical project controls and approaches that have been used, and which clearly, you know, uh, uh, you know, they don't recognise complexity um, and they don't reflect history either. So, um, no, I think there's there's maybe some maybe we can get a presentation on. Um, on alternative risk analysis techniques next time. Brilliant. All right. Any other any other questions? Um, or more generally, um, hope you found today useful. Um, thoughts for what we can do going forward. Uh, uh, ideas for future presentations. Anybody prepared to volunteer? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were spot on, Mike, talking about, um, well, I mean, getting getting the chapter in the, the pram guide is a big step forward in raising awareness and the, the understanding of complexity and the need for, uh, for more focus on it. So I think you're talking about uh, publishing in other journals um, is a really good idea, um, and yeah, exploring the tools that's that's a great idea. How we can, what's available to us to to start to appreciate complexity and model it effectively. Okay. Uh, so the um, the graph networks that I was showing in my presentation, um, I generated those using a piece of free software called Cytoscape, which was initially designed and built for biological um, interactivities between um, DNA and and that type of I'm not a biologist so the, the language is beyond me however I recognized its applicability far beyond simple biological systems um, so so if anyone's interested in cytoscape yeah just google it download it for free and you can start modeling your own your own networks there obviously the, the real challenge for most people is obtain the data to populate it with uh, and that's where having the right connections is is the uh, the added value. Oh, great, thank you, Mark. And just on having data, I'd, I'd certainly um, commend people to to find the the, the interesting parts of, of Hubbard's book because he talks about how um, uh, you actually don't need as much data as you think you need in order to reduce uncertainty. So. Um, uh, I, I think there's a, a bit of an interesting lesson that we quite often say we, we don't have the data to model risks um, and particularly the complexity space where you just it's not just sort of um, the components it's just the interaction between components which which really sort of um, uh, we have difficulty with but maybe maybe there are tools and techniques we could we could look at um, that can start to sort of say well actually it's not about having total certainty it's just about reducing the level of uncertainty okay well um we'll certainly look into um maybe we'll have the next session on uh, on um, the more specific analytical techniques then that might that might be quite interesting um if if you're uh if you're in that space or please you know um any other thoughts if people have got presenters that, um, you know, that they either would be happy to present themselves or they can um, send us ideas for other people they know of. Oh, thank you, Duncan. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think yeah, Hubbard's books. Yeah, it's got lots of interesting ideas in there and definitely sort of um, would would it, I think if people started to realize the limitations of um, of current techniques and you know, we've been trying the standard risk approach for about 30 years now, haven't we? So it's about time we uh, we started to refresh it and um, bring in some new ideas. Yep, couldn't agree more. Okay, well, we'll find out when the um, PRAM guide is being published, keep you informed about that. Um, there is an article going to hopefully going into the spring project. If uh, it might 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 be now the summer project, you know the um, the APM's magazine. Um, the company I've been working with 
um, Oxford Global Projects. We've we've been doing some work with N Plan um, to just again it's this this alternative. They're they're using scheduled deep learning to analyse um, schedules in different ways, and I've been doing a lot of work on the reference class forecasting side. So so we've produced a joint paper that um, that talks about how those two can interrelate. So look out for that. Um, Anybody else know of anything that, that's that's coming up which would be of interest to us? So I'm going to be recording a podcast um, next week, I think. So I'm not sure when it's going to be coming, when it's going to be going live. Uh, but yeah, that's going to be talking about complexity. I'll, I'll, refer, I'll make reference to the chapter that we've produced and um, the various different conversations that we've had at the SIG. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll keep you posted on that. Okay, and we'll have to have a chat with Rory about how we can um, have a, a sort of a compendium of uh, tools, techniques, and uh, um, make sure that's up to date. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jared. Oh, thank you, Jared. There's a Project Hack 13. Ah, oh, right, yeah. Is that what's the what's the theme for that? Do you know? Uh, hi everyone, uh, Jareth Reeves here. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, there's a project hack um, led by the APM and uh, the Project Data Analytics Academy. They're meeting up in London on uh, Thursday and Friday all day. Um, I think they're seventy five percent sold out at the moment, um, so there's still tickets available. Oh, uh, but it's, uh, it's a two-day session in London near uh, Moorgate Station. And what do they do? Do they have a specific theme or do they decide uh, they, what they're going to? They, they have about 10 or, or more um, different um, challenges. Um, some of them are already being published on their website, Project Data Analytics. Um, and uh, there could be a variety of things. Um, some of them are often related to risk and uh, also um, and plan reference class forecasting sort of things as well. Oh, okay. Oh, that'd be interesting. It's quite a variety, but there's also, uh, I think, Project Connect Group um, on the Thursday night, which is basically a meetup, um, a separate thing, but it's conveniently across the road at a pub. So um, that'd be quite good as well. Fascinating. Oh, yeah. Well, if, um, yeah, it'd be good. Uh, yeah, if you're happy to give us some feedback on that. Um, That'd be really good. We can maybe have a, 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 a little summary of it at the next SIG meeting. Okay, no problem. Yeah, that'd be great. And Julie, have you thought about risk audit for change management programs? I haven't found audits or risk managers really understand the risks in that area. They think they have it covered, but their documents don't show any element of the risks around change. Yeah, yeah, no, good point, risk and change. I think uh, I think it's um, an area where there's lots of duplication, perhaps, and then you, you get the alternatives where actually they're, they're totally separated and divorced. So, uh, um, are you in the audit space, Julie? No. Anybody else got any thoughts? So the, the question was, um, well, the interaction between risk and change, um, whether we're addressing it properly. Uh, no, I don't think I don't think they're as joined up as they should be. Generally speaking, um, from the projects I've worked on, it seems to be whilst they are considered in the same kind of space. Um, I think the 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 strength of the relationship between risk and change is is underplayed or unappreciated. Um, yes, yeah, so I think we need to. I think in, in following the the kind of evolution of a, a risk from inception all the way up to a change event is uh, is really valuable. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yes. And um, yeah, sorting out the liability for the change as well. It's when uh, that's when it starts to get interesting. <laughs> yeah. 
think also as well the, the additional bit is uh, there's all, all often quite a lack of understanding of the risk that that change introduces. So you've got the kind of the first part of it um, leading up to the change event, but actually what comes out of that um, wider risk that's um, incorporated in. I think we often miss that part of the, the puzzle. Yeah, that's a really good point. Perhaps another subject for a future session then. Not sure whether that's specifically complexity, but it certainly makes it um, certainly makes it a lot harder when you've got uh, um, cause and causation, which has got uh, multiple ramifications. Um, any anybody got any closing thoughts? So we've got a few ideas for a next session. Um, please feel free to, to send any other ideas through. Um, we can aim for another uh, meeting in about, we, we generally have them about every four to six months. We, we aim for four and end up at six. So, uh, um, but if there's, if there's an appetite, we can, we can definitely aim for four months if you're keen to do that. Sounds like we've got some interesting content we could uh, we could progress. Yeah, definitely. Great. You got any other thoughts, Graham? Uh, not really. I think it was a really productive session. Um, really enjoyed Mark's presentation. There's a, a lot of food for thought there. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm pleased with the, the finished result of the tram chapter. So I'm looking forward to seeing it in print. Yes, and thank you for giving us that summary of it. That was really good. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> I, this Mark here. I just asked that um, you correct my name in the reference, please, Mike. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, yeah, Graham. I think um, we've we've got um, Mark's name wrong in the. Um, you're down as John Turner, the painter, aren't you? Yeah, you've got me down as Jay Turner. Um, that's my son, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you highlighted that. Too. Yeah, we'll need to. We'll we'll make sure that's that's corrected. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Mark, for your presentation. Um, really useful and some interesting insights in that. So um, yeah, food for thought for all of us. Um, well, in the absence of, of anything else, um, thank you very much for, for um, participating. Um, and uh, yeah, please um, uh, let's let's try and utilise the the the, um, the pram guide. Let's get that that out there and into use. Um, and feedback on on whether it's been well received, whether it helps. Um, ideas for the next SIG that'd be great. People are prepared to uh, to help and. Uh, um, present or volunteer and as I say I have been chair for about three years now so if anybody else is interested in uh, in taking it on that would be um, that would be great. Mike um, I'm, I'm receiving messages here from people who are saying that um, they thought this SIG was actually running from 12 to 1 which was the um, message that went out previously. Um, right. People like to tune in or they're looking to tune in uh, at 12 o'clock so right. um, I don't know what you want to do to um, manage the expectations of these people who are going to be disappointed. Yeah. Well, I, I think you should just go through it all again, Mark. <laughs> well, do you know what? I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite happy to. Um, if, if, there, if, there are, if there is an uptake of people who do turn on at 12 o'clock. I can't, unfortunately. But no, I, I, I think I think you've, 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 you've definitely contributed sufficiently, Mark. I think. Um, um, what I'll do is I'll stay on the line at 12 um, and just apologise to those people that come on then. Did we record this? We did, yes. yeah. 
Okay, yeah. so maybe what I'd, what I'd suggest is um, we put out a message to the recording um, for anybody who unfortunately didn't manage to make it at 10.30. Yeah, and I'll stay on and just um, let people know that recording's available. Um, Rory, yeah. are you on? No, I'll, I'll ask um, Rory to make sure that um, uh, that's known to the people that uh, that couldn't make the revised time. Well, it wasn't a revised time; it was just an error on on broadcasting two times, unfortunately. Um, so, apologies for for the confusion again. And yeah, I'll stay on at twelve o'clock and just sort of um, just uh, let people know that that's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, well. Well, th for, thank you for those that have been on since 10.30. Um, been a really interesting session. And uh, look forward to, to finding out more about, about um, how complexity is, is working in your space.